Welcome. Welcome to Fearless with Jason Whitlock. I am Jason Whitlock, your host. Uh, happy Friday uh, to you and yours. Uh, the weekend's almost here. You know what? The weekend's going to be here sooner than you think because a little bit more of a concise, tight show today on this Friday. Uh, I'm not going to keep you for 90 minutes like I normally do. Uh, we're going to be a little tight on Friday. We're going to be outstanding. We're going to be good. We're going to, you know, we're going to be concise and powerful. Uh, we just got one topic. I want to talk about uh, my good friend, uh, Tony Evans, the Reverend Tony Evans' uh, new book and some issues related to that, my idea about politics. It's a great topic, great show, Chocolate Knox. Dave Shannon's going to be here uh, to talk with me about it. And then we're going to move on to our weekend. It's, it's going to be an awesome experience. You're going to get a little less of me, but you're going to get the best of me. And that's always a good thing. So uh, let's get to it on this Friday. Uh, a mob of kids, some as young as 10 years old, ransacked a Philadelphia Wawa store. Surveillance cameras captured the crime. The Twitter feed lives a four days ago. Here's, yeah, let's watch some of it. Here, here it is. Uh, I believe Tucker Carlson uh, ended up airing some of this uh, on Tuesday on his popular uh, television program. I mean, but this is just a wild scene. At some point, a, a, a little girl is asking the people inside the store, are they gonna fix her a sandwich? I, look, I, I'm sure you've seen this and you're justifiably outraged. This was madness and sadness and stupidity. It depicts our descent into chaos and lawlessness. Tucker Carlson blamed billionaire revolutionary George Soros and other progressives who install soft on crime prosecutors. They certainly deserve some blame. But I did not think of Soros or our criminal justice system when I saw the video. I thought of family and America's ongoing destruction of the natural family. I thought of Dr. Tony Evans, a Christian minister and author. I just finished reading his book, Reverend Evans' new book, Kingdom Politics, Returning God to Government. In it, Dr. Evans made me consider the true cost of America's reimagining, reshaping, and disruption of the nuclear family. I also thought of a radical solution, but I'm gonna get to that a little bit later. First, I wanna spend a little bit more time pondering the implications of the Wawa store ransacking. The average person will understandably conclude that race is the common denominator linking the kids looting the store. But it's not race. It's the consequence of young people growing up in broken homes. You know those kids grew up without a daddy. The stats are overwhelming. 75, 80% of black kids are born in single parent homes. Tony Evans in his book writes about this. The saga of a nation is the saga of its families written large. Whoever owns the family owns the future. When family structure breaks down, all manner of calamity and chaos enter into society. When family breaks down, crime goes up, poverty goes up, abuse goes up. When the family breaks down, gender confusion and role confusion go up. The political left, this is me, not Tony Evans, owns the black family. They control our future. We bought their matriarchal and godless game plan for family structure. We now have 60 years of evidence that their game plan leads to self-destruction. America must examine the plight of black people and reject the secular worldview and game plan imposed by Democrats. Dr. Evans' book does not explicitly argue that. Evans is a black minister serving a large, predominantly black congregation in Dallas. 
A significant portion of his flock likely voted for Joe Biden, views former President Barack Obama as a paragon of virtue, and believes white evangelical conservatives are bigots. Evans is a political independent. He argues persuasively that all believers should be what he calls kingdom independents, voters driven by God's biblically defined platform, not the platforms written by Republicans and Democrats. In his book, Evans goes to great lengths to avoid demonizing either political party. Instead, he uses scripture to lay out what Christians should support politically and the repercussions for our political disobedience. He lets the reader draw his own conclusions on which party or candidate to support. For me, <laughs> the right conclusions are easy to reach. The family, Evans writes, is the first institution established by God that would serve as the foundation for the well-being of society and civilization. I could have stopped reading there, the halfway point of the book. The left has reimagined family, expanding it to include same-sex marriage, and incentivizing women and mothers to abandon the traditional family altogether. Later in the book, Evans asks a simple question. Do you regularly bring Heaven's view into the discussion of politics? Evans answers his question. Unfortunately, we have become a platform of parties that won't open the Bible anymore. We won't ask anyone to explain what scripture has to say, and we are suffering the results of this spiritual exclusion from politics. The intention of Evans's book is to inspire believers to think more critically about how they use their vote. I enjoyed it tremendously. It gave me much to ponder. It also inspired in me a potential solution. How do we return God to government? All right, I can hear the leftists scream, separation of church and state, separation of church and state. <clears throat> Let me clear things up. Those words, separation of church and state, are not written in the U.S. Constitution. The Establishment Clause, the first clause in the Bill of Rights states, quote, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion. That clause, it was written to protect religious liberties and to prevent the government from interfering with or influencing the church. It was not written to stop the church from influencing the government. When Thomas Jefferson, in a private letter to the Danbury Baptist Association, referenced the separation of church and state, he was doing it to assure the association that the government would leave churches alone. The Establishment Clause wasn't even remotely debated for the first 150 years of the United States. It wasn't until after World War II that the Supreme Court started interpreting the Establishment Clause. The subsequent interpretations popularized and redefined Jefferson's church and state metaphor. The second chapter of Dr. Evans' book explains the link between God and government. The chapter is titled, The Link Between God and Government. Only a fool or an atheist would want to remove God's influence over government. America is currently overrun with foolish atheists. Let me return to my question. How do we return God to government? We do it by empowering the natural family. We enhance the voting power of a married man and woman. Each man and woman above 18 would retain their individual vote. We should grant a single extra vote to married couples. The couple would declare on their marriage license which spouse can cast the extra vote. If you divorce, you become ineligible to ever receive this extra voting benefit again. Let me be clear, the extra vote isn't about inspiring more marriages. It's about forcing politicians to develop policies that support the natural family structure. Right now, 
Politicians formulate policies that serve the needs of individuals. Once our laws support families, the improved culture will inspire men and women to seek marriage. It's a radical solution. It's no more radical than the law supporting same-sex marriage or surgical sex changes for minors. Faith in God is radical. The American experiment is radical. We need radical ideas to save this nation. Remember, whoever owns the family owns the future. That <clears throat> is my fire starter. We will discuss it uh, with Dave Shannon. But before I do that, I want to talk a little bit more about the natural family. Because you know what the natural family produces? Children in the womb. You know what a baby in the womb needs? He needs to be protected by men. He needs to be protected by fearless men. He needs to be protected by us. Preborn does that. That's why I keep coming on here telling you guys about preborn and how they use ultrasounds to help women pregnant women understand that there is a real life living and breathing inside their womb. Once a woman goes through an ultrasound, once she hears that heartbeat, once she sees that baby, it changes her mind about abortion if she's considering an abortion. It opens her mind like there's a real human. It connects the mother to the child in a way that makes 80% of those women go a different route and keep the baby. Preborn then steps in with all the support or much of the support that woman needs. So it's not just, you know, you can give 28 bucks, that'll finance one ultrasound. You can give 140 bucks, that'll finance five. But preborn does a lot for the woman after birth. They help her through the entire process. Once they wake her up to what's really growing inside of her, they then supply, pr provide the support she needs through that pregnancy and to launch her life as a new mother. Preborn is just the kind of organization we need to be supporting. That's why you've seen me on this show cough up my money, not a small amount of it, to preborn. We need to be protecting babies. We have a goal at the Blaze. We want to save 50,000 babies. Preborn has already saved like 190,000 babies. Let's help them save 190,000 more. Let's cough up a little bit of our money. Let's give, let's do something real and significant that can impact the life of a woman, a child, a father, this country. If we adopt the right mindset towards life and understand that life begins in the womb, watch how that mindset then changes how you treat that baby outside the womb. Very simple to give. Pound 250, say the keyword baby, or you can do it the way that I like to do it. I go to preborn.com slash fearless, cough up my cash. Be a good fearless soldier. Let's save some babies. Be a man, get involved. This is not a huge thing I'm asking you to do. It's the right thing. It will make you feel better. It'll make you feel like you're improving this country. It will help change your mindset. And you'll start loving life in the womb and that's gonna make you love life and see the value of life outside the womb. All right. Don't go anywhere, because I'm not going anywhere. We're just going to roll out to Dave Shannon and keep this conversation going. Dave, uh, welcome back to the show. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, yeah. I really did enjoy uh, Tony Evans' book. Uh, I, I think he, he did a, I, I think it's tough for black ministers leading black congregations to get that congregation unhooked from the mindset of my whole blackness is dependent on pulling that Democratic lever and hating Republicans. And I, I thought Tony, without taking a side and without being partisan, I, I, I thought 
he did a great job of making the case for just opening your mind to an independent uh, political thought. Do, do you agree that perhaps black ministers are in a bit tougher spot than perhaps white ministers as it relates to any discussion of politics in the black church? No, absolutely not. Um, a minister is commissioned to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and a minister that has been spending his time devoting it to the teaching of God's law and his standards from the scriptures um, has already been proving a type of implication of the, the law and the application of that law in society. And so I don't find that a minister has been proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and the implications of God's law in society and from the scriptures should be in any different position than any other pastor, except that maybe they've fallen short in following through some of those things that are biblical or have neglected to teach the whole counsel of God. So the word of God is powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts whether a white man is using it, it cuts whether a black man is using it. The question is, is he using it properly as he's supposed to use it? That's like asking me, hey, Jason, do you think this knife works differently on, a, on for this guy than it does for that guy? No, the knife works. <laughs> the problem I have is the guy who's operating the knife. Dave, I, I, I don't want to cape up for all these ministers, but I, I'm just going to keep it real, I, I do think it's harder for them. And, and I, I think it's harder for them be, because they're, they're, they're con many people in their congregation are so addicted to the Democratic Party and the left that they're afraid of running off their congregation uh, if, they, if they speak these hard, the Democratic Party is so in bed with the abortion movement, and so many black people are so in bed with the Democratic Party that it's hard, it's hard. I'm not saying they shouldn't do it, I'm just saying it's more difficult to teach and to preach these biblical truths when your congregation is in bed with a party that is, is so in bed with the abortion movement and other things it, that are contradictory to what we're taught in the Bible. If we had a congregation that had been so in bed with the issues of slavery and they loved man selling or men who loved to buy prostitutes, or we had a congregation that was bent in one particular sin or another, as a minister, your job is to observe the sheep that you have take the word of God and over time apply that word of God in such a way that you give them a different type of nourishment that they need to be able to do to what we call uh, go through the sanctification process from one side to the other. And I think you said the key word, Jason, a lot of these ministers are afraid to even touch it. So then they don't work through the progress of saying, okay, listen, this is the flock that God has given me. This is where they're at. They are Christians who need to be discipled to a particular Christian worldview so that they operate differently in life. My obligation and my duty as a pastor is to teach them what Christian humanism looks like so that they come to the right conclusions. But if a minister is afraid to do that or he's not able to observe the people in which he is talking to to be able to give them the right things they need to get there, then... That is not a problem with his congregation or a problem with the word. You have a man who's full of fear and full and afraid of man who is not going to operate in that way. It, Paul had to deal with this. Paul has examples in Corinthian and Ephesus and in Rome with people who are in sin and who are a particular type of way. And what did Paul do? He preached on it. He expounded the word of God. He said, hey, I know that you guys are letting this, this boy sleep with his stepmom. Uh, that's wrong. Don't do that. <laughs> right? Like that's just, he, he worked through it biblically and he educated them and trained them. But I think a lot of pastors leave this type of training to the outside the doors of the church, but that's not where the morality is assumed and, and centered at. It's centered from the word of God. Have no other gods before me. You shall not steal. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness. Right? All those things are 
moral virtues and foundations that come from the word of God that are expounded on and taught to the people of God and have implications out in the culture and society. Love the answer. I think it's accurate. Uh, it's why, you know, I, I, I love Tony's book because he's taking that risk. I've been to his church. I'm seeing his congregation. And, I, you know, I watch a I've been to his church. I watch a lot of his sermons online. He's taking that risk, support him and want to applaud yep. him. What do you think of his argument that uh, Christians should be unaffiliated from Democrats and Republicans, his argument is they should be kingdom independent. Um, I, I like the concept because the church itself is an international institution. So if we're talking about Christians as representative of the church, the church doesn't have borders. America has borders. Uh, the church is, I call it intergalacticism. It, it goes throughout the universe. It has no limits because the standard is outside. It gets its standards from God. So being a Republican or Democrat is, is, if we're using it in that context, it's irrelevant. We are prophets to both of them. So we have an objective standard that they have to submit to in order to be able to do what they do as legislators and as politicians. So we bring the word of God to bear in their environment, just like we would bring it to bear in a home or bring it to bear police officers or bring it to bear anywhere. So I'm totally uh, supporting that idea. The issue is, is that also as an American citizen, we still have to vote. So <laughs> regardless of where our we want to have an objective Christian position and foundation, and yet we still have to choose which one of these people are going to align with our Christian perspective and then vote that way. And it's not always clean and it's not always easy. And there is another platform that at least gives us the opportunity to engage. Right. So. I don't think it'd be wise to say, well, um, the, the Democrat platform is would allow Christians to be Christians in that environment. They won't. It's also foolish to think that the Republican platform is absolutely 100 percent Christian in every way we want to go. It's 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 not. But when you start looking and saying, OK, can I be somebody who supports life? Well, the Democrats don't let you do that. You can't be pro-life. It, it doesn't allow for that. Well, if you can't make it out the womb, how can you be anything else in, in life and culture and society? You can't. So it, ex it excludes Christians immediately from being able to support that kind of campaign because everything with it is tainted that way. With, con with At least with Republicans, if I can make it out the womb, now we can talk about how we then apply God's word to every other situation outside of that. And we can work with that. So, yes, I, I like the idea. And yet we still have to make a lot of tough decisions about how and who we vote for when it comes to uh, America, because we only have two parties. I didn't force this into my mono, but it's something I, I wanted to address. It, 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 it's like, and I will at some point, I'll go back to Dallas and I'll ask Tony about it. But, and, and you know what, I, maybe I even brought this up when we were at dinner, but, uh, he makes an argument in the book that he, he doesn't take a side as it relates he, to the abortion issue and in terms of he, he doesn't he basically defends both parties. He says that some people uh, place an emphasis on life inside the womb and that the other political party places an emphasis emphasis on justice outside the womb. And, and, and part of my contention is that justice starts inside the womb. And the people that aren't on board with justice inside the womb, you'll never convince me that they're for justice outside the womb. If it, it, you know, they missed the whole starting line. It's like, uh, it's the people that showed up late to the 100 meter dash. If you show up an hour late, you're not going to win the race. And so if you, if you show up late on this issue as it relates to life, you're not going to, oh, well, now that the baby's here, I'm the people that can tell you how to properly love it. There's no scientist. There's no doctor. There's nobody that has studied children in any real way that won't tell you, no, these things you do before pregnancy and during pregnancy 
impact that baby post pregnancy. So justice actually starts before insemination. <laughs> That's right. And it's certainly once the baby's created in the womb, you better be on board with justice because if you haven't, the baby's going to receive an injustice inside the womb that will be carried out once it's delivered and living outside the womb. And so that's where, you know, I, I, I get what Tony's doing, but I, I probably disagree. Uh, you you got to be at the starting line if, you, if, if you're going to make me believe you're serious about competing and or winning the race. Well, and, and they're they're trying to play us, Jason. That's that's the way they're trying to play us and say, well, if you're not socialist, then you're not pro-life. Well, that's stupid. OK, <laughs> it's just stupid. So part of so, here, so and when we talk about justice, I think we need to be very clear. Justice has to do with crime. If there it's not a, I'm not being a criminal because I don't give you money. I'm not being a criminal because I don't make sure that you have 17 jobs and, uh, and make 30 to 50 thousand dollars a year. I'm not being a criminal because I don't do that. Now, I can do that, and that's a great idea, but you are being a criminal if you kill someone, <laughs> okay? These are completely two different things. You are being a criminal if you're stealing from someone. If I say, for instance, like, hey, I want you to live, that's, that's, uh, that's justice. You should be able to have life. I'm not being criminal if I don't give you $50,000 a year, $60,000 a year, pay time off, and make sure that you have child care. That is not my responsibility. That is not a law required from God for me to be able to, to give you. I'm to make sure that you have life, that you are to be able to go about freely living your life so long as you follow the law. And so what they're trying to do with this and make this seem like, well, if you don't care about life outside of the womb, then you— you you're not pro-life. And it's like, wait, I am trying. By the way, I'm the person who wants to give people the ability and have the policies to have whatever job they want to make agreements with people on how much they want to make without the federal government getting involved. Don't even get me started about how I feel about life outside the womb. But just because I am trying to make sure a person stays alive and can live doesn't mean that I have to provide a whole type of lifestyle for them. That's socialistic. And nor does it mean that I want that I have to have a gun pointed to my head and get robbed by the federal government to bring from what I make to give to somebody else. Giving is a free opportunity to love somebody else without the federal government over the top of them. Those two things are different. And this is where we really have to make the uh, really have to understand what and how are they operating with what they want to do? It sounds Christians to say that people need to make $60,000 a year and have child care, but that's actually not Christian. It's not my responsibility to make some, sure somebody else has child care. It's to make sure that they have the opportunity to work so that they can have child care if they so choose. And there's a big difference, Jason. Yeah, and, and again, I suggest everyone go out and read the book because Tony makes a lot of these arguments. He, he's... I'm someone that as it relates to taxes, and, and maybe it's because I've lived too spoiled and pampered a life, but I really don't care that much about what I get taxed. But man, he put together an argument that we're getting, the government is way out of bounds with how they're taxing us and what the Bible says and what our position should be. I mean, he, he really opened my eyes to like, I got this wrong. Uh, and <laughs> he's like, if, if, if God only told uh, the Jews to give up 10 percent and the government wants to take 30 and 40, <laughs> the government wants more than God. Wow. Yep. So it, it was he made some really compelling arguments as far as that goes. T t Dave, what do you think about my argument, which I think is pretty obvious that this whole separation of church and state thing has been conflated? misused, misguided, that, that anything that Jefferson and the founders were actually talking about and what the, what the Constitution and the Establishment Clause is talking about, is like, no, 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 we don't want the government messing with these churches. Now, you churches, y'all make sure y'all keep an eye on the government and influence the churches. They saw that as a good thing, and we should too, and that's like the whole basis of, of Tony's book, which I love, is like, no, we need to return God to the government, make the government 
uh, adhere to what God says and what Christians believe and think and say and, and, and make sure that the government doesn't interfere with the church, we've got the whole thing backwards. Absolutely. Um, when people bring up the argument, this separation of church and state and uh, whether or not, you know, the government was influenced a whip from Christians and they were all paid. It's just it's such an asinine argument, to be honest with you, Jason. It's one I have hardly any tolerance for because I know those people aren't reading or doing any basic study. I mean, when you look at the Revolutionary War itself, the very thing that, you know, the war for independence, the, the, that what we were doing here, they called it the Presbyterian Rebellion. OK, like that's what they called it. And there was a reason for that, because of the way that they understood humanity and man and God. They knew that you couldn't treat human beings this way and that the king had overstepped his boundaries according to the authority that God had given him and how the king should operate with those authorities and who he should defend with those authorities. And because he wasn't acting Christ like the, from the authority that was given him, we had to rebel. It was the only option that we had if we were going to be good Christians, because he's overstepped his authority and we need to set up a government that sees its authority properly and serves its people based on the nature's nature's God. And so when people ask me, talk, talk about it, I almost have no tolerance for it because it's not that hard to just do some basic reading. Shoot, take a trip out to Boston and everything out there is established in the foundations of Christian worldview. Everything. You, you, you can't walk without seeing it. You can't go to Virginia without seeing it. And so it, I find it hilarious that somehow we are able to find slavery in everything that we've done in our founding documents, but we can't seem to find God. It's just hilarious. That's a great point. All right. Now to the bigger question. What do you think of my crazy radical idea of trying to empower the family, give people like yourself and your wife an extra vote? to represent your family as a way of tilting the government towards favoring families over people like myself. First, Jason, I couldn't wait for this. I, I, you make me so happy when you get radical. I love when you get radical. It's one of the best things that happens <laughs> when you get radical. I like it a lot. I like what you're doing because um, you're thinking properly about the process of incentivizing good and then punishing evil. This is right in line with Romans 13, right? The government's responsibility is to reward good, incentivize good, and then to shun its nation from evil. That's part of the duties that God has given it. I think, though, I want to take some exception only because I think it's a little Machiavellian in the idea that all the authority and power has to come from government in order for the family to be able to have um, a true impact in the culture and society. And so I don't think all the power is in government. I think all the power is already in the family. And if people would do some basic things, they would, for instance, I have, there's nine people in my household. That's nine votes. If the government never changed anything at all, I have nine votes that vote my direction. The problem isn't that I need more votes. The problem is that I need to keep the votes I have. We have done a horrific job of raising and training and discipling our families to fear and honor God that the left has come in and stole the votes away from us. So long as the left continues to come in and disciple those votes away from us and disciple our families, it doesn't matter how many votes that you decide to give to the to us, we're going to lose them if we don't plug the hole. We need to plug the hole of the family. You ask the question whether or not we can get God back into the government. The question first needs to be, can we get God back into the family? Can we get man to do the things that they need to do so that they train kids that honor their mother, honor God, honor authorities, obey, go to work, figure out how to create industry for their neighbor, are able to take care of themselves, health and welfare. So, yeah, I like I like the progression we're going because I think we're going in the right way. And I think you're going in the right direction. If I had to tweak it a little bit, I would say, how about we remove tax? Um, I, I, I do want to incentivize marriage. So if there was one thing, I'd say, hey, incentivize marriage as much as you possibly can. That's in, that's essential because the foundation of your society is based in your marriages and your families. But if I could do one thing, I would say let's remove the taxes from the income taxes from family 
remove the uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and let them be able to take care of themselves and provide for themselves economically. And that way, the government isn't robbing them and their money. They get to keep it in their home. And I would say I would find a way to disincentivize divorce. Right. So I do like what you were saying about divorce. I think divorce is horrible for a nation. And so I would disincentivize divorce and I would remove certain taxes from the family so that they could be able to uh, have more money in their pockets to provide more jobs, do their own health care and be able to make their decisions without the federal government picking in it. Okay, so let me ask you this. Let's say we wanna, hey, how do we uh, remove the taxes from the family? H how do we create an environment where that's even a possibility? Politicians have to be sitting up every night, what can I do to court the family? What can I do to satisfy the family? What can I do to please the family. And the only way they're going to do that is that they, well, you know what? The family is the most powerful vote that we have. And I get your deal like, hey, man, you got seven kids. I can disciple and raise them up and blah, blah, blah. But that's 20 years from now or, you know, however, you know, 15 years, yep. 10 years from now or whatever. And, and I, I'm, I'm saying, I guess I'm trying to come up with a shortcut that if I empower Dave and his wife, Delano and his wife, TJ and his wife, Virgil and his wife, uh, that we can get there quicker and make politicians say, you know what, I gotta do things to make Dave and his wife happy. Let me remove this tax burden up off of them. And boom, now, now you, whereas, I'm telling you, politicians are sitting around going, what can I do to make this single baby mama uh, vote for me? Oh, I, you know what? I'll cover all of her insurance needs. I'll give her a tax credit for any uh, child care needs she has. I'll make the public school take care of all of her baby's needs and basically serve as her daycare system so she don't have to do nothing but worry about going to work and we got everything else covered. There, thinking constantly, how can I, and I'm sorry to say it, but how can I make life easier for these irresponsible people like Jason Whitlock and some of these single baby mamas, rather than what can I do to make Dave and his wife happy with me? Well, I like the fact that they're, I mean, the cutting taxes is nice, but I kind of just want them to leave me the heck alone. You know, leave me alone. We, we can be just fine. Jason, I think you are thinking about a short term solution. Um, we didn't get here because we legislated our way here. We got here because we had broken families. The home. Oh, oh for one second, David, it's a great point. I'm not disagree. You don't think the government has offered incentives to break the family? Of course. I think they have offered incentives to break the family, but the family has to first take those incentives, right? So it, they outside, so think about it like this, Jason, in the Garden of Eden, before the fall, even before the fall, God told Adam to do two things, to cultivate the garden and to protect it. There had been no sin yet, and yet he was told to protect it, right? So regardless of, the outside influences or the outside fighting in battle, the man is responsible for protecting his home. Even though there might be incentives that push the opposite way, if the family doesn't take them, that means that those incentives don't have any impact to destroy it. So if I am guarding my house, managing my home, and doing what God has told me to do, they can try and incentivize all they want to because the power doesn't just come from the politics. Politics is a long-term game. The left knows this, which is why they went after education and for the last 100, 150 years have been whooping our behind because they have played the long game. If we decide to play the long game and my kids grow up over the next 150 years, I will have a small city of people who will have a, um, a, a barrier around them of leadership that the outside influences won't be able to affect. And so over time, 
they die out and they lose no matter what type of influences they tried to run my way. So long as we don't take the bait. A mouse don't get caught if you don't take the cheese, Jason. You can put the cheese out there all you want. But if we are the kind of people who know how to protect ourselves, love our, love our neighbor, love each other, raise our kids with fear and admonition of the Lord, the politics power doesn't have an effect on us. That's why a nation fears people who don't take the bait. That's what they have to do. That's why all the handouts came out from the government. Because of the people didn't take the bait and said, we don't need it. We're going to make it ourselves. They said, well, wait a second. We don't have control over these people. All that stuff is, those incentives are hooks to get you to do and be manipulated by them. If we are the kind of people that don't take those hooks, we don't have to go that way. And so I guess my whole point, Jason, is saying like, yeah, I, I get that they're trying to manipulate and incentivize the family, but my kids aren't taught by them. My kids don't take their money. I don't take their money. They don't have any hooks in me. I teach my kids. I feed my kids. I train my kids. They learn authority. They learn to shoot. They learn to fight. They learn to see traps. And so over the next 150 years, my great grandkids will be the kind of people that will be in the positions that these guys currently hold now, making the laws and removing the authorities that are seeking to um, create those incentives to harm the family. That's the long game. In the short term, I just have to be faithful, do the small things I do, do what I do with voting. Move, do what I, I would love for those tax incentives to be there, but it's not all where all the power is. All the power is in my household. That's where the nuclear power is. Dave, you're giving me much to think about. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much. Awesome job as always. Uh, I told you guys I wasn't going to keep you long today. We're going to let you get to your weekend. That's it, and that's all for us. Uh, I hear tomorrow. That means we'll see you next week. Freedom, look for a breakout, feeling like a standoff, nothing in life, like freedom. Came like a fighter, striking like a ladder, making all this moves for freedom. I want freedom. No negotiation, my system, no relation, we all just want to have freedom. Sitting on the corner, never been alone, I'm breaking my back for freedom. We are living, get back, we are receiving all the seed when we all want to be free. We want freedom. I just want, I want to be, I just want.